Thank you for coming and for listening. I want to start by asking each one of you to uh, focus on one thing, to take that ability we all have, let everything drop aside except just one image I would like everybody to create in their brain. And that's an image you've been invited to a party. And you are opening the door to walk into this party. And as the door swings open, you see your closest friends in the world, the people that you care the most about. And you see an amazing spread of food, everything you could imagine, and drinks. And as you walk through the door, the hostess says, come on in. There's plenty for everybody. Help yourself. And that feeling that gets created through that image, I want you to keep in your brain. Because the feeling of that image is best described by the word abundance. And I want to say that it's completely possible for us as individuals and for us as a society to create abundance. That we are not victims of the economic system in which we live, but we are the creators of the economic system in which we live. And to illustrate that creativity and how we make our way in the world and how we create abundance, I want to talk a little bit about my personal story. And um, as a young boy, I had planted in my mind this seed of knowing that I could be wealthy, that I could create wealth. And if you looked at my surroundings, I grew up in a town that was consisted at that time of factories that were closing. And there wasn't anything there that would lead me to that conclusion logically. But I had a belief, a seed that was sown inside of me that I knew that I could do that. And from that belief, I acted on that belief with the heart of a young child. And I started out at five years old selling lemonade on a lemonade stand. And I saved that money and leveraged that money, and I started selling newspapers before you were old enough to do so. And by the age of 12, I convinced my mom to open a stock brokerage account. And I leveraged that money until by the age of 19, I was able to completely finance my education at a private university and had enough cash to buy a 58-acre investment property by a ski resort. That's creating abundance. And the whole key to it was the belief that I maintained that I could do that. That I wasn't going to allow the world to tell me what I was, but I was going to define who I was from inside me and not listen to the voices, the many voices would say, you can't do that or that doesn't make sense. So this is how you create individual wealth. And from that, I would like to go and talk about how we create uh, wealth as a society for all of us. And there's a pretty clear picture of how that happens. And it follows the same cycle that we follow in terms of birth to death. And if you look at economies, what happens is that economies that innovate, that bring new things to life, that find new ways of doing things, are economies that grow and prosper and create abundance for everybody. And the key to that is this innovation. It's finding new ways to do things, better ways to do things, better products, better processes. And as human beings, we're endowed with this infinite capacity to be creative. And if we tap into that infinite capacity to be creative, we can fuel this life cycle of innovation. And you've seen it in the United States. We've done a good job of that through the years. And if you look at the history of how you take one thing, how we communicate. And we want to communicate with somebody from a distance. So the telegraph was invented. Beautiful, and it worked great. And you had the area of the telegraph. 
And then it was replaced by the landline telephone, and then on to cellular and smartphones. And understanding this cycle and this life cycle of innovation is really critical to understanding how we create a society, an abundant society. Because at each stage of the birth of a new invention, incredible things happen from an economic standpoint. At the birth of the telephone, what happens is that you create new markets. People didn't have phones before, now they have phones. They can do something better than they used to do. And the people that get in on that innovation in the beginning, incredible wealth is created. Incredible wealth for the people that are smart enough to get in on that. And it, you can look at case after case and country after country where this pattern re repeats itself. The fuel for abundance is innovation. And the root of it, that is in our creativity, in our individual creativity. And so the question of how we fuel our economy overall comes down to this. How do we fuel this cycle of innovation? And it turns out that there's a couple of different types of innovation. There's what you might call new stage or infancy innovation. It's when something is very first born. And just like a human, when something is very first born, it's not very efficient. It's kind of awkward and clumsy and uh, creates a lot of disruption, you know, as a child does when a child's born. And a new innovation is like that. It's never a case of, well, here's the greatest thing and it's really clear and this is how it works. We kind of stumble our way into it gradually. And so because of that, in order to fund and fuel innovation, you have to have a lot of patience and you have to try a lot of times and fail. But the way that it works is that for all the failures, you only need one hit because the hits are huge. They're absolutely astronomical. You look at a company like Apple and what they did and how that became the richest company in the world as a result of the innovation that they did. So innovation is the key in this early stage or infancy innovation is the absolute key to driving abundance for our society. Now let's look at where the US and the UK and Japan and some other sort of well-developed countries are at this point in time. If you study uh, those countries and what's going on, there's another kind of innovation that I would call mature innovation. And an example of that would be in the car industry. So back when Henry Ford was around and he was the first one to do an assembly line, that was a crazy idea. At the time, it was a crazy idea. This is not going to work. But in the early stages of the assembly line, great wealth was created. Fast forward to today, we still have assembly lines. And we still have innovation where a lot of money is plowed into, how do I make this car better? And that usually boils down to, um, <coughs> we'll put another robot on the assembly line. And as a result, we can make this car for $100 cheaper. And that investment in mature economies attracts money because it's much more of a sure bet. You know how many cars are sold. You know if you make one each $100 cheaper, you're going to make money back. And so we invest in these mature innovations so that we can get the return on our money. The difficulty with that is that we ignore these innovations in their early stages because they're more cumbersome, they're more problematic, they're not as easy to figure out, are they going to work? An example is, and you can see this in another TED talk, it's pretty interesting to watch, but there's a guy in India and he invented a bike that you can ride across the pond. So you say to yourself, well, that's an invention. But what about an innovation? How many of those bikes are going to be sold? One? One million? You have no idea. But investing in that kind of innovation is absolutely critical for the lifeblood of our society.
Because if we do 100 of those investments, one of them is really going to be the next big thing. At the time that the, the government had the patience to invest in the internet, it was a crazy idea. But look at the impact of that on our economy. So my encouragement is to find any way that we can to fuel this uh, investment in innovation and in particularly in this early stage innovation. We still have to do the other thing. We have to be able to make cars cheap. But when we look at the impact on the overall economy, the impact of uh, innovating at an early stage is it creates jobs and it creates interesting jobs. When you innovate at the mature end, it's a job destroyer. Because I'm already making these cars. If I make them with a robot and I make it cheaper, it takes less people. It's a job destroyer. An early stage innovation is a job creator and an interesting job creator. Because if I work for a company that's building bikes that goes across a pond, that's kind of cool and fun. And how do I figure out to do that? And how do I figure out how many people are going to buy it? It kind of gets my heart flowing and me pumping and really interested in that. So early stage innovation has the characteristics of job creation because these are new markets. They didn't exist before or expansions of markets. More jobs, more jobs that are interesting. And the other thing that is really cool is that because there is ideas can pop up anywhere. If you are a millionaire or you're a pauper, it doesn't matter. You can have the greatest idea in the world. So if we fuel these early stage innovations, the other really neat effect it has is that it creates wealth where wealth does not exist. It creates wealth for people who do not have it. In our economy today, if we think about that, what a find that is where people talk about the gap in income and the problem of taking from somebody and giving to somebody else. Here is a solution that doesn't require that. All it requires is that we tap into our infinite ability to create and put on a really robust way, create these cycles of new innovations. And that will create the wealth that we need, that will create the wealth for abundance. And that's an incredible story that we have to tell. And I'm very, very excited about. So, you know, when I, uh, when I studied economics, the, it struck me that the first syllable of that word, economics, ek, sounds yucky. So, my idea is to replace that ek with the word heart. Because the key to moving to this kind of an abundant society is first for each of us to care about the impact of what we do, do on everybody else economically. Our heart is at the heart of it. And if we care, it will cause corporations, foundations, rich individuals to think about this impact of innovation and early st stage innovation and fund that rather than take the money that exists beyond need and just use it to create more money because that doesn't fulfill a need. So that is my encouragement. That's my dream that I'm very excited about that we're at a perfect point in society where we have the money and we have all the creative ideas it's just a question of funding them, like a shark tanks on steroids. <laughs> and um, so with that, I'd like to say that I, that picture that we drew at the beginning, that picture of abundance, I would like to see us all make the decisions individually and as a society to create group wealth for everyone and create the abundant society that we all deserve. Thank you very much.